The next speaker is Marcus Bosson, CEO at Quiapeg Pharmaceutical. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marcus Bosson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Quiapeg Pharmaceuticals. It's a biotech company located in Uppsala. Our main asset is uh, Unicleaver. It's a drug delivery platform aimed at increasing the half-life of pharmaceutical ingredients. And uh, this uh, platform is suitable for small molecules, peptides and uh, proteins. And um, what is key here is that it's a releasable link chemistry. And uh, this has uh, reached a broad protection, intellectual property rights in United States, Europe, and uh, actually last year also in Japan. We have built up through years a pipeline of uh, two very interesting projects. One is a QPG 1030. It's a pegylated version of tetaglutide um, for short bowel syndrome. It's an orphan drug indication. And QPG 1029, which is a pegylated version of liraglutide aimed at type 2 di diabetes and obesity. Our main asset is Unicleaver. It's releasable pegylation. Here we see the key qualities of a Unicleaver platform. It's universal, it's released either by enzymes or pH. All humans have the same pH in the body. It's uh, 7.4, so uh, hence we don't need to adopt to any different pH. It's effective, it will be a complete release from the drug, original drug. So that will be intact once released. It's versatile also, we can modify this linker chemistry. So we have a release ranging from hours up to weeks which translates into maybe going from once daily to once weekly or even once monthly. Uh, this means fewer doses. Uh, it's of course better for the patients and also it will lower the cost to society. If you look at the slide uh, down below, you can see Unicleaver marked in the middle. And on the left, you have a PEG, it's polyethylene glycol. And on the right, you have a drug. And uh, what's the purpose of a PEG? Well, that ne is needed also for the half-life extension. The current medications, uh, which are pegylated, are permanently linked to the drug. And uh, that means, of course, a longer half-life, but it also takes away some, or man in many times, most of the biological effect of the drug. Releasable pegylation, which Unicleaver is all about, solves that problem. So Unicleaver provides release, so you get um, a longer half-life, but you get a bi biological activity in full for the drug, which is released, as you can see to the right on the slide. So this is for a lot of peptide developments, new peptides. Uh, they tend to have low half-life and Unicleaver definitely could be a very good solution to that problem. It's also possible to create new improved versions of already existing drugs. That's called life cycle management. So many companies maybe they have a blockbuster peptide and they would like to extend the patent protection and offer the market a kind of new approach that could be going from once daily to once weekly. In that case, Unicleaver could be a very good solution. I said permanent pegylation is quite common, which is very good for us because that means peg is really solid on the market. And peg is just something we buy from the shelf using, but Unicleaver is unique. And uh, if we look at the competitors here, we have uh, Ascendis Pharma, which is a Danish biotech company listed on NASDAQ and has a market cap of about $6 billion. Uh, they have a uh, human growth hormone going from once daily to once weekly. Uh, quite successful, it's on the market now. And you have a few other companies, and one of them actually was acquired a year ago for about $1 billion plus uh, from Sanofi. So uh, the, the market uh, is quite small, and uh, so we have definitely a good niche and opportunity. Uh, for business development and maybe also potentially to be acquired of a company. And briefly about the patent estate. The patent estate is very important. Uh, that's the first thing next to the biological data, of course. If th those looks good, uh, then the next step is uh, due diligence in the patent estate. And I'm proud to say that we have now built up over the years quite strong patent estate. We have allowed or issued patents in Japan, European Union and United States. 
So let me go over to one of the projects uh, uh, which we co focus our efforts on right now. It's tetraglutide. It's a <coughs> so-called GLP-2 analog. It was approved in uh, 2012 uh, for the treatment of short bowel syndrome. Uh, in Swedish, it's Tuntamen. It's an orphan drug indication. And either you are born with some uh, faulty short bowel uh, or uh, because of disease, they have to remove parts of the whole of it. So then you need GATEX. It's administered daily injections, and it's a very cumbersome process. Mo many, many patients, uh, they need actually a nurse to administer it every day. So you can imagine if we could get from once daily to once weekly, that would be a big relief for the patients. It's really a large unmet medical need, and uh, those out there are uh, Glepaglutid, it's a Danish company, but that will be twice weekly. Apraglutide, which I would say is the main competition, it's once weekly administration. It's a Swiss company called Vective Bio. And the global market is uh, expected to reach about $2 billion by 2030. Here are some data. It's really a true pro drug. And what do we mean by pro drug? Well, it means when, if you remember the, one of the first slides, you have a peg, you have a unicleaver, you have a drug, and you connect that to one unit. And then it's a, if it's biologically intact in the bloodstream at that point, then it's a pro-drug. So it doesn't release anything or d does anything to the body. But then slowly, gradually, and in a controlled way, uh, the pH will cleave um, uh, systematically uh, and release the drug. And then it will uh, retain the full biological activity. And as you can see from this slide, we can see that tetraglutide, they, it has an effect immediately and it goes down. And you can see 1030 actually uh, is not biological active, which is what, what we want to see. We have also done a proof of concept study, a small intestine weight. So this is really hard facts. Uh, it's not biomarkers or anything like that. We take out from the rats uh, the small intestine and uh, see the weight, the weight growth. So in this study, in rats, uh, we used tetraglutide, which is GATEX. We used our uh, 1030 and we compared to, to our main competitor, apraglutide. And as you can see, we are significantly better than tetraglutide. And we are as good as main competitor, apraglutide. In this slide, it looks a little bit like we are slightly better, but this is hard facts. And the bottom line is that we can see the slow release. We can see a much longer elimination of half-life compared to tetraglutide. Uh, we have a, a, a five times increased exposure compared to other doses of tetraglutide. And this proof of concept study, which is um, commonly accepted as the proof of concept in preclinical studies, so we could see good growth in weight and for 1030. So this is compatible with weekly dosing intervals. The market potential, briefly. Um, this reflects the fact that it's very cumbersome to administer, often by a nurse. And uh, you can see in the beginning, 100% uh, of the patients are happy, but then after a while they say, oh, this is too cumbersome, uh, this is really so. They, they uh, quit the treatment, and uh, that's a really big problem. And uh, today, GATEX, uh, even though it's very cumbersome, is sold, has a sale of about $750 million. So if someone like us uh, could come up with a drug which is a uh, good biological effect and uh, it's once weekly, uh, definitely there is a, a room for improvement and a large unmet medical need. So according to some cal calculations, uh, this market for short bowel syndrome and the treatment will increase and also you can uh, probably look at other indications uh, than uh, SBS also. But if you elaborate and uh, imagine you get about 20% of SPS patients in US, uh, Europe and Japan and uh, uh, over the years and uh, you have approximately the same price level as the current treatment, then you reach a revenue peak at uh, $2 billion. So it's definitely a blockbuster potential for 1030. And the competitive landscape, um, I mentioned Takeda, they have this GATEX, which is already on the market, once daily. 
Then if we have our competitor, Vectibio, uh, preglutide. It has a market cap of about $500 million. Uh, it's once weekly. It's supposed to be for once weekly. However, it's a novel peptide and has a limited clinical record. It's now in, in phase three. But uh, 10.30, we can benefit from tetaglutide and its uh, publications and what's public about uh, the filing. So that means we could probably use Section 505b2 when we would like to file uh, at the appropriate authorities. Uh, and that would also save us time and money. Sealam Pharma, Danish company, they, tried to, uh, they have tried to develop glipaglutate for once weekly, but uh, as far as we understand, it's, uh, maybe it will be bi-weekly. We will see. And uh, the 9 meters by Pharma, it's a GLP-1 actually, so it's not a GLP-2. So it's very different from uh, our approach. And uh, a little bit about the other project, it's 1029, pegylated liraglutide. So we go from orphan drug indication to a more, a much bigger indication, type 2 diabetes and obesity. And obesity is really a big thing right now, and everyone is talking about semaglutide, which is taken once weekly for obesity. And uh, this could actually be competitor uh, if it's successful with semaglutide for once weekly administration. We have seen proof of concept in rats. Uh, we have a slow re release profile in mini pigs. And uh, this leads up to hopefully once weekly administration. And uh, we have also granted, uh, been granted a patent which is by 2038. So uh, as I mentioned under the other one, this is already a uh, approved drug, liraglutide. So even also here, we can probably draw on the and file under section 505b2. So the take home message here for Quiapeg, I would say it's a very unique uh, drug delivery platform with a releasable mechanism. And that's the key word here, releasable. So there are other platforms, uh, but uh, this is releasable. So uh, you connect PEG, Unicleaver, the drug, and altogether it's uh, inactive, but then con in a controlled way, slowly, uh, you get the release of an active uh, drug and it becomes biologically active and does its job. So that means we can go from once weekly, once daily to once weekly or even once monthly. So that's a huge potential and it's also very desirable. And uh, we have two preclinical projects with blockbuster potential. And uh, the patents uh, are uh, key in our uh, future success. And uh, I think we have a very strong patent estate. We've granted patent European Union, US, Japan. That's the most important market. Right now, we are focusing on business development and licensing deals, R&D collaborations. I would also end this presentation by saying that this could be also quite good potential acquisition target for big pharma looking for half-life extension technologies, which they could play around with in multiple fields, small molecules, peptides, proteins. My final slide here, we have an upcoming rights issue now in March. It will commence the subscription period, uh, March 15. And uh, the issue size is about 20 million Swedish. It's a unit, so it's one share, and then you get uh, two warrants for free, one which is in September this year, and uh, the other one is in April next year. And the subscription price is uh, two euro per unit, and it's 100% uh, guaranteed this uh, upcoming rights issue. So um, I think I leave it there. Thank you so much for that presentation. And the main takeaway is that uh, patients will only have to take their medicine once a week instead of once a day, thanks to that technology. Could you elaborate a bit on what you think, how will this affect patients in general? Well, in general, for the short bowel uh, syndrome uh, patients, um, our goal is, of course, not only take it from once daily to once weekly, but also develop it in a, into an auto-injector, so it could be really simple to administer and uh, just do it uh, like uh, people with diabetes, they have an auto-injector. And that would be really convenient because today, as I mentioned, most patients need a nurse coming home to their home 
and administer it. And uh, it's a very cumbersome process. So seven, eight steps before you inject it. So if we could develop it into an uh, auto-injector, but if we could not, uh, if once a weekly is uh, good enough. And if we look a bit at the competition, you're not uh, completely alone in this area. No. For example, we have Vector Bio, who's mm -hmm. a bit ahead of you here. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the competition? Competition is always good. Uh, it shows that it's uh, uh, of great interest. And uh, the really um, the main competitor, as we see it, is uh, this Vective Bio, um, the $500 million uh, market cap uh, company. And uh, they are in phase three. So we can learn a lot from their uh, uh, clinical trials. And uh, we have also access to uh, apraglutate, which is uh, the name of our drug. So that's why we could compare it straight on with apraglutide, which is very good for us. But we have a BioBeta. So we have another shorter version of filing an application called Section 505B2, whereas Vective Bio has a completely new peptide. So they need to go the full extent. So maybe we need less patients in fewer studies to show the same and reach the market. But yes, uh, they are ahead of us. And uh, But this is a large market and you always have room for more than one. Uh, take painkillers, Alvedon, Iprean, uh, you have a multiple, uh, even though it's a big market, or in diabetes, uh, every drug has a, a, a certain um, a difference uh, compared to each other. So definitely there is a, a room for, for improvement and room for more than one. So uh, uh, I don't see that as a problem. I see. And last year you signed a letter of intent with a Chinese corporation. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about what that deal looks like? Yeah, so we uh, have been in discussions and we signed that letter of intent. So the purpose is for them to, uh, they, they are developing a, a biosimilar version of uh, tetraglutide. So the, the whole thing is to partner with someone and uh, they would do the conjugation. We would deliver the linker, they would do the conjugation. They have already invested into the development of tetraglutide. So they have an option also to get a license for China. Uh, we will most likely retain the rights for, for Europe uh, and elsewhere in the, in, in the world. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of a win-win situation and uh, where we could uh, forward this project, moving it forward uh, with the help of someone who is also already in the biosimilar market. I see. And let's end with talking about the rights issue yes. that's coming up. Yeah. Why should one invest? Um, I think we are at an interesting crossroad. Uh, we have uh, two uh, uh, very good preclinical products with great potential for outlicensing. Uh, we have uh, the Unicleaver platform, which is available for outlicensing, and you can slice that platform either for a license for a certain indication or a license for a certain drug. Uh, and uh, thirdly, um, because thanks to uh, that we have built up um, quite good, uh, I would say very good, a patent estate. We've granted patents in European Union, uh, US and Japan. Uh, I think after a due diligence, uh, any, any major company who would like to get into this half-life extension uh, uh, technology, uh, they will see it's, it's very good and uh, that uh, we are certainly a potential acquisition target for, for another company. I see. It will be interesting to follow. Yes. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you.